In 1259, Genghis Khan's grandson Hulagu threw a curveball. He funded a giant stargazing lab in Iran. Picture Hulagu fresh off conquering Baghdad, agreeing to bankroll an observatory because a Persian scholar, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, promised cosmic secrets, even future-telling. Legend has it Tusi staged a dramatic pot-drop stunt atop a hill. He arranged a giant cauldron to tumble down, scaring the guards, then quipped, See, an unseen force caused that chaos, just like the stars. Charting the heavens will calm us all. The king was sold. The Maragar Observatory was born, and no, this isn't a joke. Records show construction began in 1259 under Hulagu's patronage. In 1253, the Mongols began sweeping through Persia. By odd luck, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi was imprisoned by the assassins and got freed in the conquest. In 1256, Hulagu's forces captured Alamut, Tusi's fortress, instead of execution. The scholar won an apprenticeship as Hulagu's chief advisor. Some chronicles even say Tusi helped plan the 1258 siege of Baghdad, toppling the Abbasids. The Mongol Khan needed good omens, and he soon put Tusi in charge of the realm's Waqaf funds. Hulagu, having made Maraga in northwestern Iran the Ilkhanid capital, was intrigued by astronomy. Tusi pitched building a grand observatory, even hinting he'd predict the future with it. Enthralled by astrology, Hulagu agreed, and construction began in 1259. In effect, he became the first ruler to sponsor a scientific observatory with religious endowments. Tusi appointed Moyad al-Din al-Urdi to run the project. The campus was enormous. Excavations found 16 structures, a circular four-story tower, 28 meters wide, and five connected platforms. The complex also housed living quarters and a library said to hold approximately 400,000 volumes. But above all rose the instruments themselves the marble and copper tools that made the Maraga legendary. Inside Maraga, it was like science fiction on a hilltop. Over a dozen years, the observatory buzzed with activity. Blacksmiths hammered giant copper plates, librarians catalogued thousands of scrolls, and astronomers from all corners of the empire squinted at the sky. It was a true international campus. Even Chinese, Georgian, Arab, and Armenian scholars came to study. In one illustration from Tusi's own star tables, he's drawn in green, conferring with colleagues over a globe. Among the first tasks was getting water up there. al -Udi built clever water wheels and pumps to lift well water to the summit. This kept the whole complex running and fed all the clepsydras inside. In fact, dripping water was one of the main clocks. Astronomers would note a star's meridian transit by the clepsydras readout. Those water clocks were surprisingly precise, about plus ten and five minutes accuracy. Towering over the main building was the mural quadrant. This was literally a quarter of a circle affixed to the tower's south wall, with degree marks etched along a 40-meter radius arc. In other words, it was a wall-sized protractor. An observer would line up a sighting tube with the sun or a star and read off the angle on the brass scale. It became the observatory's own prime meridian. Noon was defined when the sun crossed this wall. Under another portico sat a giant armillary sphere, a metal model of the heavens. Its series of brass rings formed a skeletal sky. By turning handles, scholars could simulate celestial motions, see the sun and moon roll along the rings, or swap which ring sat as the horizon. In effect, it was a build-your-own planetarium, an analog computer for the sky. They had a few more tricks, a solstitial armilla, a ring aligned to measure the sun's tilt at solstices, an azimuth ring for compass bearings, and a parallactic ruler, Triketrum, for quick height measurements. Basically, Maraga was an arcade of astronomical gadgets. Besides the copper towers and tables, Maraga had its own foundry. A metalworking shop on site cast and shaped all the instruments. Blacksmiths ran wood-fired furnaces and hammered brass, adding soot and spark to the night sky. If a piece cracked or a scale wore off, they melted and recast it themselves. On busy nights, the clang of hammers mixed with the scribe's chalk squeaks. It was part instrument factory, part school. Even a dropped hammer or misplaced weld had to be fixed by dawn. They had more gadgets, too. Alongside those big installations were portable astrolabes, handheld starfinders, for quick readings and sundials for daytime. And in 1279, Al-Urdi's son Muhammad cast a bronze celestial globe. Imagine a globe a meter across with silver stars dotted on its surface. By spinning it, the astronomers could quickly check any star's position an ancient Google Earth for the sky.
Between four irregular tables, Moraga had functionally done what would later be done with telescopes and computers. By night, the routine was intense. A student spotted a planet rising in the east, others fetched the quadrant and aligned it to the meridian, then read the angle. Another noted the time on the water clock. Scribes logged the altitude and time in leather-bound notebooks. Every clear night, they recorded dozens of positions for the sun, moon and planets. Over years, these logs grew huge. According to Mohammed Al-Quilji, Al-Maghribi, they even estimated lunar eclipse brightness with stunning accuracy and tracked eight reference stars with the quadrant. The results were uncanny. Sun altitudes were measured to approximately three, one accuracy, planets approximately four, six. For perspective, Jupiter's disk is approximately 50 wide. All this hard work went into the grand finale, the zij e ilkhani Ilkhanic Tables. Completed in 1272, it was like the Google Maps of the sky. It tabulated where each planet would be on every day, when eclipses would occur, even refined the calendar. Next Persian New Year will have Mercury at 10 degrees Aquarius, the ZIJ might say. These tables, published under Hulagu's son Abaka, became a reference for generation. And who was in Tusi's math posse, along with Urdi's crew, were stars like Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi and Fekhar al-Din al-Maragi, scribbling numbers by lantern light. Even Bar Hebraeus, the famed Christian polymath, moved nearby just to use Maraga's library. One illuminated page from the Ziji Ilkhani shows Tusi in green teaching at a round table with al-Urdi, al-Shirazi and others. Beyond instruments, Maraga's scholars pushed ideas. Centuries before telescopes, Tusi proposed that the Milky Way's glow must be millions of faint stars. He tweaked Ptolemy's models into something more physically realistic, inventing the famous Tusi couple of two circles, a math trick that Copernicus would later adopt. Nightly debates asked big questions. Why does the equinox shift? How do planets loop in the sky? By gathering mountains of data, Tuzi answered dozens of such why questions, laying groundwork for future astronomers. The environment also played a role. Maraga sat approximately 1, 700m above sea level near Mount Sahand, so nights were crisp and clear most of the year. Winters were chilly. Scholars joked they carried hot coals in their coats during observations. The circular tower had open galleries, letting each floor be a classroom or lab, with south-facing windows for the instruments. On stormy days, they scrubbed the equipment and polished the metal. By night, they resumed star work by torchlight. At its peak, the observatory was like a non-stop science fair on a hill. After midday meal of rice and dates, two students might race to solve a tricky trigonometry problem. The loser had to refill all the clepsidrus. Hulagu himself occasionally dropped by, clad in fur, to see an eclipse prediction. When it happened on cue, he reportedly tipped gold coins to the team and quipped he'd need a bigger protractor next time. Meanwhile, Tusi looked more like a thrilled professor than a courtier, perhaps wondering if war was any harder than this math. By Tusi's death in 1274, the vast observatory had served its purpose. Its instruments fell silent and the hills settled into history, but the knowledge they generated echoed for ages. After a few decades, the Maraga Observatory's glory waned. Tusi's son, Sadr al-Din, ran the place and Ghazan Khan even visited it several times, but without Hulagu the funds dried up. By the early 1300s, the big instruments sat idle and the halls lay empty. Earthquakes and neglect eventually toppled the walls. Even so, Maraga's ideas lived on. Its astronomical tables were copied for generations. Copernicus later borrowed its geometric tricks to simplify planetary orbits. And in the 1700s, Indian King Jai Singh built the Jantar Mantar, explicitly citing the Maraga tradition of large instruments. Today, the hill is a quiet ruin, with a protective dome over the remains. But the star charts and models from Maraga continue to influence astronomy. In sum, the Maraga Observatory shows that science history has the wildest origin stories. Even a drop pot and a Mongol Khan's whim can launch a revolution. The giant protractors and globes are gone, but their legacy is written in the stars. Remember, centuries before Galileo peered skyward, Maraga's team was already busy mapping the heavens. So next time someone says medieval science was backward, remind them of Nasser al-Din al-Tusi and his stargazing visionaries. For them, the sky was not a limit, but an invitation.